You're listening to the Wool Academy podcast. This is episode number 70. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Van Delden and once a week we talk to an industry expert from the wool industry supply chain from farm to fashion and beyond, delivering strategies and insights to be successful in wool and showcasing those beautiful stories wool has to tell. Today's podcast is a recording with Mark Grave from the Australian Wool Exchange, in short, AWEX. I had the opportunity to talk to Mark during the IWTO Wool Roundtable in Port Elizabeth in the beginning of December of 2017. I very much enjoyed my talk with Mark and I hope you do as well. So it's wonderful to be, to be talking to you today here in Port Elizabeth uh, mm -hmm. in person because that's always very special. And I would like to get us started by you introducing yourself and tell us the work that you do in the wool industry. Sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, firstly, it's, it's great to be here as well, I must admit. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity for me and for us as a company and, and a great place to be when the industry is so strong, which is really nice. So my name's Mark Grave, I'm Chief Executive Officer of Australian Wool Exchange. And Australian Wool Exchange is an independent company in, uh, that services the wool industry and we provide services ranging from on-farm inspection services, wool classing, uh, registration, education and standards uh, and that's important to our customers overseas. We provide market information. Uh, so all of the market reports that come out from Australia, whether they're from an analyst, an agent or whoever, they all start with us, the information we provide, um, as well as a whole range of other services which really are about underpinning uh, the quality and integrity of the market so that the traders can trade. And we've been doing that now for just over 24 years. Great. Then I actually want to talk to you about all the different services because I, I think you really do add so much value to the wool industry and I would like to go through some of them bit by bit. So uh, my first interest is um, wool classing. So yeah. what is your role in that? You know, wool classing has got a really strong and rich heritage in Australia. Like it's been registration and I'll separate this. People have been classing wool for probably 60, 80, 100 years. Uh, back in the 1960s, uh, Australia got very serious about it, realising that we needed to have not just people who knew about wool, but actually were trained to prepare wool for the buyers to buy and processes to process. So our role, and we inherited it, um, is that we provide the educational resources for the training for all of our trainers around Australia. Um, we provide a registration service that makes sure that we can monitor the performance of a wool classer, that they uh, have access to education material and we, we do that primarily so that a wool classer who receives a stencil, it's like having your own license, um, and they apply that stencil to every bale that they prepare. So if I was a buyer or a processor and I buy some wool that has a class of stencil, on it. I know that it's actually been by, prepared by somebody uh, who is educated and trained and that I should have some trust and confidence in that product. So that's the real uh, essence of what uh, wool classing is about. And they actually learn through you the different, the fineness of the wool, mm. etc. Yeah, look, as I said, it, the wool industry has got a lot of information and has had a long history. Uh, we have uh, schools and, and uh, training edu educators who actually deliver the courses to those wanting to become a wool classer. And yes, they have to learn about the fineness and strength. They have to find out what are the, uh, the best parts about wool and those parts that actually have to be taken away and, and mm -hmm. kept separate. Um, because that's what the buyer expects. And Uh, if anything, the wool classer is what we call the first step in, in pro wool processing. Mm -hmm. They're the last person to see it, the wool as it goes into a wool bale. Uh, the next person who sees it will be the processor in Europe or China or wherever they may be, in India, uh, when they open that bale. So it's important that they have a sound education. Okay. I actually um, just um, published an interview with Chantelle McAllister. Um, she's a master classer. She is. And uh, she also does this great um, 
Truth About Wool campaign. And yeah, that brought me also to the topic of um, women working as a classer or master classer. And I also saw on your Facebook page that you had a national graduation wool classing competition. Mm -hmm. And what struck me is um, among the finalists were a lot of women. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, we've been running that competition now for I think about eight or nine years and I think from memory seven of those eight or nine years um, have been won by women mm. <laughs> and not just young women, it's women of all ages and it's a, it's a cultural shift over the last 20 years. If we've been having this conversation in 20 years ago, we'd be talking about a workforce that was 95% male, 5% female. Um, what we're finding now is that's completely shifted. And, and for wool classing specifically, there seems to be around about a 55 to 60% female ratio of people, uh, uh, women actually training to 45, roughly, to 40 to 45% male. And that's significant. Um, I think most people regard agriculture, farming and wool as male dominated but there is a lot more interest from women particularly now on farm too because uh, it's a way that they can actively contribute to the farming business it's a way that they can actively uh, gain employment or contribute financially back to uh, their own lives and if I know this isn't going out on, on the internet and not going anywhere but Women actually have a really good feel for wool, the, uh, and I'm not sure why that is, but you'll often find that women's attention to detail, their understanding of the fibre is a lot higher or more readily higher and available than what you find in men. So we're actually seeing a lot, lot of that happening, and it's actually starting to transform the workplace. Mm -hmm. So it's not such the, the bloke male culture, um, with more women involved, you're getting a much be better balanced uh, uh, work environment. So it's it's really pleasing to see. Yeah, I love that story. It's great. Thanks for giving us more details about that. And then you are also involved in the Open Cry auction. So mm -hmm. tell me a little bit more what your role is there. Uh, we, we facilitate it. We provide systems um, that allow the the sales to take place, but more importantly, I think we provide the rules, the business rules. Um, everyone loves to see a good game of football or a good game of tennis, uh, but at the end of the day, if you didn't have an umpire and you didn't have rules, it would just be chaos. And it's no different here for selling or trading, whether it's wool or, or uh, grain, it doesn't matter. Uh, so what we do, and this is, I think, what people have to understand is that we just don't sit in a dark room and make up this, this stuff. We actually talk to the industry and we do it in consultation with them. But we develop rules that actually create an efficient system. And that al allows the buyer and the seller to trade openly, fairly, uh, in transparently. And so our role is really about the system itself, the platform, the software platform that's used and also the rules and, and administration around that. And given that the auctions are roughly 90% of all wool uh, sold and traded in Australia, it's a significant part because we're talking about, a, in a Australian dollar terms, probably a, a $4 billion industry. So we need to make sure that our systems and our rules uh, are well oiled. And what would be an example of a wool? A rule, oh look, even from simple things of when when a sale will take place, uh, you know, what people do when there is a dispute, um, providing the system so that the, the, the data can be transmitted and shared uh, in a timely fashion and making sure that everybody complies with that. You know, they're very basic, but at the same time, that's what makes it work. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, we've got a long history of, of wool and wool sales. You know, even programming of the sales, when they're to take place and so forth, what day of the week. It may sound very you know, basic, but a lot of those things are actually very important to how, it, how a sale or how a trading system operates. Mm -hmm. And is there a rule on how you cry out during the sale? Uh, the better the cry, the, the okay. better the price. <laughs> uh, look, everyone has their own style and... 
Uh, from time to time, we actually run schools, uh, either schools on how to sell, so we have efficient auctioneers, but also bidding schools because uh, we quite often get people saying, oh, look, I'll go into the room and buy. But it's never that simple. You have to know what you're dealing with. You have to understand the dynamics of the room um, or else you could either make a lot of money or lose a lot of money. And it's about actually creating a fair trading environment. So it's not just simply sticking up your hand and making a, 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 a noise. Uh, you actually have to understand what selling and trading is all about. And that's part of it. Yeah, when we had the IWTO Congress in Sydney, uh, there was a, a wool sale organized in the hotel for everyone to watch. And you could really sense the energy in the room of the buyers and, the and concentration. Th that's true. And, and they play off each other. You know, I think anyone would understand that when you have momentum, it creates, it creates a compelling story, but it's also energizes the room and uh, so the trading in, auction in that sense is a very good theatre uh, but is a very transparent theatre as well. Mm. Okay thanks uh, for, for I, I was always just wondering more about the auctions because from an outside you you, you can't really, you can't there are glass windows you can as a visitor look in but yeah if you're not there it's It's a mystery how that if, actually If works. it's the first time you've seen one, mm -hmm. you wonder how <laughs> does all this mess work. Um, it's quite enthralling, but uh, yeah, it takes place 45 weeks a year. Yeah, that's amazing. And then there's also something that um, I always wonder about how it actually works, and that's the AWIX Eastern Market Indicator. <laughs> can you explain that a little bit? Uh, Maybe in easy terms so that I can understand. Yeah, I think, uh, I hope so. Um, <laughs> The Easter market indicator is is seen as an index. So in other words, you measure it one day against the next, you can see whether proportionally how the market's risen or fallen, the state of the market. What it's made up of is a two, two baskets of types, and they reflect the bull profile in the northern region and southern region. So that's essentially Queensland and New South Wales is our northern region and our southern region is South Australia, Victoria, Tasmania. So it's really just an indicator. It, it really, it's not something that you would price wool on, but it's a good litmus test of how the market is going, positive or negative or, or status unchanged. Uh, it's made up of, I think from last count, it's about 120 different types of wool. Um, that's not so much important other than to know that it, it does reflect the, the growing profile. So what we've tried to create is, so I can compare the performance of the market one day to the next. Uh, if I want to get down more in depth into the market, there are other indicators that you would use to actually compare if you were a wool grower, compare your wool uh, one day to the next. So a lot of the devil is in the detail but it is really a what we call a basket of types that reflects the profile, the wool growing, most popular wool growing profile in those two regions. Okay, so then someone like me could say, yeah, right now, I could see right now it's going up in general. <coughs> and yeah, it's a bit like looking yeah. at share markets. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the, uh, the Dow Jones index is made up of in, in the States, but at the same time, I know if it's up 10 points or down 100 points, I know whether the market is going okay mm -hmm. or whether it's performing poorly. Uh, but it's just for the Australian market? Just the Australian mm -hmm. wool market. Okay, perfect. And then there's another interesting project and actually yesterday we have been here in South Africa to BKB and they were testing the RFID, or using already the RFID tags yes. and you have something called the eBail. So what is this project about? Uh, the RFID wool, uh, tags on wool, it's, it's really about having machine readable identification on a wool bale. Uh, we've been looking at this for the past 20 years and that sounds a long time, but if you, you probably can't because you're too young, but if you go back 20 years, technology was nowhere near as advanced as what it is today. Uh, and in the last five years, particularly even the last three or two or three, the technology advancements have been huge. So we've been looking at how we might be able to introduce that and what benefits, and this is the key, it has to deliver benefits. Uh, it's And not just benefits to one 
segment of the market. It actually has to deliver benefits along the pipeline. And once you start talking about e-bail, we call it e-bail, and once you're talking about RFID on a wool bale, you start talking about using an app to record it or uh, technology or software to utilise it, everybody's mind starts to accelerate as to what it might do. So I think the answer is we don't know the full potential of what this will do, but we do know that it will bring great efficiencies uh, and hopefully uh, be able to uh, maintain or deliver lower cost through the industry, and that's important. So in the first essence, and we're, we're commencing our trial in West Australia in March, uh, it will be recording that information on farm and that will be the start of the journey of the data. So the data will then work its way through to the, the broker, to the trade, uh, and to the processor eventually. And that will help tell the story because once you have that linkage, you can look up the supply chain to see where your wool has gone. You can look back through the supply chain to see where your wool has come from. And with that, you'll be able to tell a, a much, much bigger story about wool, which is what we all want. Mm. So there's a lot of optimism about it. It's not just about logistics or about creating efficiencies in warehouses. It's actually about transfer of information. It's actually being about traceability. And there, between traceability and biosecurity, there are two big areas that all hold lots of potential and uh, we think will have uh, tremendous benefit for the industry. And will there be certain things that you will always be tracking on those RFID tags and then so if someone wants something additional it can be added? Uh, it will mainly be people adding because everyone's mm. concerned about privacy and they mm. should be. Um, everyone's concerned about governance over that information and they should be. Mm. So. Our tag actually has the unique number on it, which will identify that it's Australian wool, uh, that it's wool and it's Australian and it'll have a unique number. What then happens is that you will add information to that. So if somebody scans that bale, all they'll get is the number. Mm -hmm. If you want the full information, you actually have to join or be part of the industry to have access to it. So there's natural protection of privacy. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm sure and confident that once, as the wool progresses through the pipeline, that that will actually be tested and people will actually want more information to be added to it rather mm -hmm. than on it. Okay, but then individual actors mm -hmm. in the market can decide yeah. what they want. If That's you good. purchase my wool, you should be entitled to actually look back and see where that wool has come from mm -hmm. and all the information around that wool. Okay, well I hope the project or the test phase yeah. goes successfully next year. Thank you. And something I think that are, is kind of taken for granted, but everybody needs to use them, are the wool packs. Yep. And I once uh, heard you ac actually also talk about changing the wool packs and so on. So talk a little bit about the standards that you have for wool packs. And well, how I is that important? Oh look, packaging is always important. We, we've had various types of wool pack and packaging over the last 50, 100 years. And each time we've changed, we've changed for a reason or wanted to improve what we have. We now use nylon, we now use a, a because it is a low contaminant. It still is a contaminant, but a low contaminant when it comes to wool. Um, and it's lightweight, which is great from an occupational health and safety or work health safety point of view. Um, but we should never be complacent. And so we, we need to make sure that it not only complies with our needs as an industry, but also uh, legislation, road laws. That was one of the big issues we faced recently. You made you know. them smaller. Oh, I did make them smaller. We actually made their structures more better, stronger. Mm -hmm. um, and that was due to... Uh, transport lorries and trucks that were carrying wool were actually too wide with wool on them. So we actually had to try and contain that the nylon was stretching. Mm -hmm. So we needed to put in some structures and change the design slightly to hold that wool or, or reduce the amount of stretch. And that's been effective. So I think the thing we learn out of this is that we should never be complacent. Um, there will be, be new put wool packs in the future. We don't know what new materials will be available in the future. So we have to keep an open mind to that. 
But the expectation is that a wool pack that is imported to Australia, because they all are, uh, must meet the needs of the industry of the day. And therefore our standards, the standards we use in Australia, are important because they help us deliver that. Um, so it's, it's, it's probably the forgotten side of, of the wool industry. It's a bit not unlike when we were talking before about uh, providing services that underpin the auction trade. A lot of the things that we do underpin the trading, but without it you get chaos. Without it you get uh, non-compliance or you don't meet the needs of the industry. And it's the industry that's actually important here. You need to understand the industry and hopefully do what we can do to uh, facilitate that trade. Yeah, and I think it also shows what attention to detail actually goes in every single thing that is involved in, in the uh, industry. Well, even before we started, uh, you know, I'm, wool packs have been around since the horse and buggy. Um, so they've been around for a very long time because you need to package and move wool. Um, so there's been a lot of detail. There's been a lot of time to think about that detail. Mm -hmm. And we, our legacy is to try and carry that forward and continue to improve. Yeah. And there's another um, thing that I found that you actually have a mobile app called the AWEX Sheep Breeds. Compendium. Yeah. So tell yeah. us about the app and what does it do and who uses it actually? Well, anyone can use it. It's a free app. Um, and it's available on Android and Apple. Uh, but what it was, it, it started. We started off the conversation about wool classing. Now our wool classes will go into any shear on any farm, any shearing shed around Australia, and they can be confronted by any breed of sheep. So it's important that they understand what type of sheep they're they're about to shear and class, and what that wool can be used for and even suggest how that might, uh, how they might class it. So we started off uh, probably 10 years ago now mm -hmm. where we actually used to print booklets. We had a one version, then came out with a better version. But again, like I was saying about technology, not everybody wants to carry a booklet anymore. So we developed the app to do that and it makes it a lot more flexible, a lot more portable and gives the opportunity for anyone to actually access it wherever they might be in the world for that matter, uh, to look at the different types of breeds of sheep and the uses of the wool, which is important from a classing pers perspective. Uh, and it's a, it's a bit like having a ready reckoner. It's a reference document. Mm -hmm. So uh, we make that available for them. And is it just sheep that are predominantly in Australia or yeah, other sheep breeds? Well, it will grow. Mm -hmm. uh, The initial phase is that we will have we have sheep that are only available in Australia, and I'll be absolutely honest: not all of the breeds are there, um, but there's only a few that are missing. These are the main commercial types of, of sheep that we see, and many people around the world will recognise some of them, if not all of them. So, but the flexibility of technology is that if there's an opportunity to increase that uh, that information, then Having better information gives us informed wool classes, an informed industry, and a better industry. How many sheep breeds are there right now? Oh, <laughs> off record or on record? I think on the, on the record it's something like 37 or 8. Okay. Uh, off the record it's probably double that. Okay. I'll, I'll make sure to also link um, to that app so people can yeah, check it out. Please do. I even have it on my phone. So. Oh, I do? There you oh, go, good. yes. <laughs> And then today you um, talked at the Wool Roundtable about the National Wool Declaration. I would also like to ask you to explain what is actually the National Wool Declaration. The National Wool Declaration is uh, a declaration made by a grower. So it's a statement made by the grower for the person who will, their customer, who will buy their wool, process their wool. And it's around their mulesing status, what, how they look after their sheep, whether they mules, whether they don't. Um, we introduced that back in 2008 because growers were saying, it was a sensitive issue in Australia, but growers were saying, well, this is what we do, we would like to promote it. And we had exporters and processors asking us, saying, well, how do we get that information? So the only way to do that was to actually uh, introduce something that was in the information stream. So the introduction of the National Wool Declaration was specifically designed to do that. 
underpinning all of that again, I keep using that word, but it's true, we provide services to maintain the integrity of it. It's not just a piece of paper. And the integrity is what uh, we hope gives confidence to the buyers and processes of Australian wool. If they buy, buy some wool that is declared as non-mules, they should have faith that it is non-mules. And if they're questioned, they can also back that up. So we've been doing that now for a while. We've learned along the way uh, from our mistakes that we've made early on. And uh, we're always looking to improve it as you should. Uh, but we think it delivers a really good service to the industry and one that they can rely on. And you are actually, from what I understood this morning, you are actually also doing audits um, yeah. to ensure that integrity that you were talking about. Yeah, that's the compliance part. Uh, it's important that we check. It's important that we ask the questions to make sure that and that there are no mistakes or, or if we have mistakes that we can rectify them. Um, and compliance, people think of compliance as just uh, more like being police, but it really is more than that. It's actually about where there is uh, need for education or extension, there's the opportunity to provide that. And the overall uh, result is that we have a better and better informed industry, a better informed market. Okay. And do you, so you said you've been doing this for since 2008, so almost 10 years now, and you said you learned a lot, so what are the challenges that you had to deal with? Uh, the challenges is to, as always, is to uh, get greater involvement. You know, currently our declaration rates are around about 65%, so that means there's 35% that aren't declaring, of growers that aren't declaring at the moment. Now, the challenge is to understand why challenges to say well what do we need to do to improve it to make it more attractive and uh, hopefully more intuitive uh, and also to I suppose communicate those messages through the supply chain how can we help those that are trading to communicate a story um, I think we've learned over the years that the industry is full of good stories and these are good stories so it's, it's a matter of being able to help communicate that and uh, let others do that for us. Okay. Thank you so much. Before we stop uh, with this interview, I would like to ask you, what is your favorite story or experience that you had during your career in the food industry? It's kind of, oh, we're leaving wow. AWEX, but it's... I, speaking of stories. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wonder if I could actually... I, I don't know that I could number it. I've, I've been very fortunate in this job. Um, and very grateful. Uh, I've had so many experiences uh, around the world, even within Australia, but I probably would say that the greatest thing I've learned or got from it is the people that I've met. Um, I sometimes refer to the wool industry as a passionate industry with passionate people, uh, but the people that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are really what make it. So for me, I, look, there's probably many stories I could say that would be probably amusing to me and boring <laughs> to everyone else, but um, I think it's the people. My, my greatest joy out of this job is the people that I meet on a regular, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. And it seems to be universal. Uh, you know, the type of people in this industry in Australia Uh, the same, if not e very similar to those in South Africa or through Europe or America and so forth. So, uh, you know, we've made some fantastic friends along the way. Yeah, and I think you, we all experience this passion and this also kind of family-like yeah. feeling at this wool round table uh, these last few days. Now, uh, where can our listeners find out more about AWEX? Where should they go? Uh, come and visit us. Come over to <laughs> Australia and visit. Um, <laughs> That aside, uh, always go to our website, uh, which is you have uh, our AWEX corporate website. Uh, we try to provide as much information or links through that. Um, we always try to improve that too, but uh, that's the best way. And certainly contact us at awex.com.au. Okay, I'll make sure to link to the AWEX website on the show notes. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for taking the time today. It's been great. And now we can all 
enjoy the rest of our afternoon in South Africa and Port Elizabeth. And I wish, wish you much success with all the different projects and services that you provide to the Australian wool industry as well as to the inter international wool industry. Thank you and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Hopefully you enjoyed this talk that I had with Mark Grave um, a couple of months ago. If you want to find out more about Mark as well as about AWEX, just head on over to the show notes at elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 070. Once again, head on over to elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 070. If you are active on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter or LinkedIn, then make sure to follow us on these platforms so that you are always alerted when a new podcast is coming out. I look forward to connecting with you there. Thank you and bye for now.